I get asked all the time why I became vegan. I've actually been vegan now for 12 years, so if you want to find out some of my reasons, make sure you keep watching. So 12 years ago, I became vegan. I was living in New York City at the time and I just happened to go into a Barnes & Noble bookstore in Union Square. I had some time to kill. I was just looking through books. I had had a, a lot of struggles with weight. Um, I w had been, ever since high school, I had started gaining a lot of weight and then when I moved to, away to New York, I wasn't eating home cooked meals. So I definitely had gained my freshman 15. So I was going through the book, through the bookstore when I saw a title that really caught my attention. Um, number one for the profanity and just the balls that the author had to name their book that title. So um, I picked it up. <clears throat> the book was called Skinny Bitch and it did change my life because it did not mention veganism at all on the title in the back. Um, I picked it up, I just read the, uh, the first few pages, and when I saw that there was more depth to this book, that it wasn't just some superficial book about, oh, eat this little bit and do this, but that there was actually some depth and rationale for the points that these authors were making, I purchased the book and I read it that same day, the entire thing, front to back, I read it going on my way home, I read it on the subway, I read it when I got home, and my mind was blown. I had no idea this book discusses everything from what goes on in slaughterhouses, how the FDA doesn't really care about our food and what they're putting into it. A lot of the people that are supposed to be helping us on the Food and Drug Administration, a lot of the individuals in the FDA have at one time or another worked for the dairy industry or have worked for the meat industry. So there's definitely a conflict of interest. And they their concern is not our health. Their concern is to fill their pockets. Are there a few good people on the FDA? Maybe, but uh, definitely there are some where there's a conflict of interest and their number one priority is not our health. It's greed and it's to make money. And it's really sad. And this book opened my eyes to that. Uh, it also discusses the environmental impacts of going vegan. So again, this book serendipitously fell in my lap and absolutely changed my life. And I went vegan. As soon as I read it, I went vegan the next day uh, and I never looked back. Meat wasn't that hard for me to give up. What was really hard for me to give up was dairy. I absolutely loved ice cream. Um, I loved cheese. I loved all of that. Thankfully, I was living in New York at the time, and um, there were a lot of vegan restaurants even there 12 years ago. However, when I moved back to Florida, people had no idea what vegan was. They were like, what? Vegan? What's that? Oh, but you could still eat eggs, right? Oh, but you could still eat cheese. Oh, this is vegan, and it was like an egg or an omelet, you know? The main reasons why I went vegan is health. Uh, I'm a person that I love to be healthy and I want to do everything in my power to be healthy. I absolutely love animals, so I'm against animal cruelty. And also due to environmental factors, you know, we are living on a finite planet and the things we're doing to this poor planet are astonishing. You know, the use of palm oil, we're doing deforestation, we're cutting down our rainforests, we're killing the orangutans for the palm oil. So even as a vegan, you know, Oreos are accidentally vegan. So even as a vegan, I don't consume palm oil. So I would not consume Oreos that are accidentally vegan because of the palm oil. Nutella uses palm oil. We are killing our planet and it's sad what we are doing to it. And we don't realize that what it breaks my heart. It really breaks my heart. And we don't realize that this is going to bite us in the ass. This is all going to come back to us because what we are doing to the earth, we are doing to ourselves. We are all connected and it's a domino effect. I did my um, thesis project on the health benefits of a vegan diet. I was getting my master's degree at the time and I did extensive research on 
the comparing the benefits of a vegan diet or I had to do a vegan and vegetarian because there wasn't enough data on veganism at the time. So I compared a vegan slash vegetarian diet versus an omnivorous diet. And what the research shows is that people that follow a vegan diet have lower BMIs, which is the lower body mass index. They have uh, more weight loss. They reduce their risk of heart disease by lowering their cholesterol. They have lower chances of getting certain types of cancers, including colon cancer. And a few years back, the World Health Organization published a study that found that red meat is increases exponentially the risk of getting colon cancer by consuming red meat. Also, being a vegan lowers your A1C. That your hemoglobin A1C is the measure of how your glucose measurement over the past three months, what your blood sugar has been. The higher A1C, the more likely that eventually that is the diagnostic factor for, oh, you have diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Um, so the lower, the better that your body is performing and that you don't have that much sugar constantly flowing through your body. Sugar is not good in your body, high rates of sugar, because it leads to microvascular and macrovascular changes. When your blood sugar is too high, it damages your, damages your vision, it damages your kidneys, it damages your vessels, uh, it predisposes you to stroke, heart disease, all that. On average, vegans live seven years longer than omnivores, so people that eat both, uh, people that pretty much eat everything, and quality of life. Yes, I could eat a vegan diet and I could get hit by a car tomorrow, right? Um, I could even, I can still get cancer even if I follow a vegan diet. But for me, it's about quality of life. It's about, I'm a nurse, so it's not, I've seen, you know, diabetic patients with uh, both legs amputated. My fa grandfather had both his legs amputated because of diabetes. That's not the life I want to live. I want to live my life so that, God forbid, something does happen to me. I know I did everything in my power that this is not my fault, right? Yes, I could get hit by a car. I could become a quadriplegic, but that's not my fault. Um, there are things that we can do. Yes, does type 2 diabetes run in family? Yes, does, does hypertension run in families? But a lot of times it runs in families because you have a genetic component, but also a lifestyle component. You've been brought up by these individuals to eat a certain way, so their habits are being passed down to you. You can break the cycle. Just because everybody in your family has uh, type 2 diabetes doesn't mean you have to have type 2 diabetes. A lot of times we embrace that victim mentality so that it's easier, so that we don't have to do anything about it. It is harder to meal prep. It is harder to eat healthy. It takes more work initially. I've been doing it for so long that it comes easy to me. My father's side of the family, most of them have all died due to heart attack and they've died very young um, or they've died, uh, most of them have died due to heart attacks. My dad is still living. Um, his cholesterol levels are, are good. He follows for mostly a vegan diet and um, he's beat the odds. He doesn't have type 2 diabetes. He doesn't have uh, heart disease risk factors and he's living a better quality of life than his father because again, he, for the most part, does partake in a vegan diet. Um, I went vegan because of this book, and then I talked to them, and they decided to um, go mostly vegan as well. So they, for the most part, do cook vegan meals. The key is a balanced diet. I've known people that have tried to go vegan, and it's disastrous for them. They feel weak. They, uh, they don't do well, but it's because they're not eating a balanced diet, you definitely do need your protein. Uh, I uh, supplement with protein powder. I love my protein shakes. So I buy a protein that's called Orgain, O-R-G-A-I-N. And it's organic. It was developed by a physician that got cancer. And um, it tastes delicious to me. So that's one way that I supplement with protein. But animals aren't your only source of protein. There are soy products, there's tofu and edamame. Now, there's a lot of argument about, oh, does soy cause breast cancer? Well, even certain physicians, let's, let's put this in perspective. Physicians are very knowledgeable about disease processes and medication. They are not experts on nutrition. They take maybe one class on nutrition during med school, and that's it. We should not be getting our nutritional advice from physicians because, honestly, they don't know. 
a lot of the research that I have done is independent research, looking up studies and things like that. But recently, the American Cancer Society did publish a study that said soy does not increase your risk of getting breast cancer. So soy products such as tofu and edamame, those are packed with protein. And it's all about learning how to make these foods so that they taste better for you. Other good sources include seitan that is made from gluten, so if you have celiac disease or gluten intolerance and you can't eat that, chickpeas, lentils, and nutritional yeast. And like I said, I supplement with protein powder so that that's an easy way for me to get my protein. Essential fatty acids. A lack of essential fatty acids has been associated with problems related to brain health, cognitive impairment, and depression. When we talk about essential fatty acids, we're talking about like the omegas, 3, 6, 9, and mostly we have way too many omega-6s in our diet and we need more omega-3s. So you can get omega-3s and essential fatty acids by uh, consuming whole grains, leafy grain vegetables such as kale, spinach, and collards, and almonds, walnuts, or pistachios. Of course, they're, the nuts are high in calories, but when you go vegan, you start losing weight if you're not consuming junk food all the time because you can be vegan and still be overweight. But the thing is that the body processes this, this portion of almonds differently than this portion of a highly processed food that you buy in a box. Whenever possible, do not buy processed foods. They're not your, it's not the same. I think a lot of our, our issues are coming from how much our food is processed and how little we're eating of natural whole foods. With B12, I don't even play around with iron or B12. I supplement. I supplement with an iron supplement and I supplement with my B12 because I do not want to be deficient in those. In my 12 years of being vegan, I have never been deficient in, in I have never been anemic and I have never um, been deficient in iron. The only caveat I will say is recently, because of emergent surgical procedures that I had to have, my hemoglobin dropped. But prior to going to Colombia, I had just had my blood work and my hemoglobin was uh, 13. So I, ha as a vegan, I have never been anemic. I have never had low B12s. I had never suffered from any type of deficiency. All my labs look great. Um, so B12, I do supplement. A lack of B12, very dangerous. You can feel tired and weak. And it can also, if you lack any type of vitamins, it can lead to neuropathy issues. So um, it can be challenging for, for vegans to get B12. You can, have, you can consume fortified cereals, fortified rice, and soy drinks, or take a supplement. Like I said, I don't play around. I just supplement. It's not a big deal. Um, essential fatty acids, a lack of, and that was on the other one. So this is a repetition. With iron, I also supplement um, because red meat, egg yolks, those have the highest source of iron. But again, eggs, very high in cholesterol. Red meat, no. So um, good plant sources of iron, those are black-eyed peas, tofu, dried fruits. Fresh fruit has iron too. And uh, vitamin D levels, 10 to 15 minutes of sunlight exposure a day can give you vitamin D boost, or you can drink fortified orange juice or soy. We live in Florida, and a lot of, well, I live in Florida, and a lot of people are, you wouldn't think, but are deficient in vitamin D in Florida because they're in their cars all the time and they're actually getting out. So 10 to, 10 to 15 minutes of sunlight is actually good for you. Now, my other reason for being vegan is the environment. The production of meat and other animal products, it places a very heavy burden on the environment because of we have to grow these crops and animals eat more than people. So we have to grow these crops and water and feed it to the animals where we could be feeding those crops to people. We could be feeding those crops to more people. Additionally, we had to transport these from farm to fork. And the, mast, um, the vast amount of grain feed required for meat production is a significant contributor to deforestation, habitat loss, and species extinction. We are losing a lot of our animals. In Brazil alone, the equivalent of 5.6 million acres of land is used to grow soybeans for animals in Europe. This land contributes to developing world malnutrition by driving impoverished populations to grow cash crops for animal feed rather than food for themselves. So, for example, on the other hand, 
lower quantities of crops and water are required to sustain a vegan diet. So switching to veganism is one of the easiest, most enjoyable, and most effective ways to reduce our impact on the environment. For me, being vegan is not a sacrifice. Like I said, once you know where to shop, what to eat, what ingredients to look for, what products are better, the, your body thanks you. Your palate changes. You don't crave the nasty processed food. I don't crave fast food. If you want fast food, what I eat is a vegan bowl from Chipotle, right? But again, that's not processed. That's natural vegetables with guacamole and lettuce and all of that tastes delicious to me. But you have to give it a chance. You have to give an opportunity. At first, if you're used to eating junk, remember, these corporations are putting stuff in these foods, high amounts of sugar, fat, um, and chemicals in order to trick, trick your brain into loving it. Sugar works similarly to how cocaine activates the brain. So of course you're going to crave it initially because you're addicted. Now, there, the population on this earth has been exponentially increasing. So the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations predicts that by 2050, world meat production will have almost doubled as the Western taste for meat, eggs, and dairy products continues to grow. And of, of course, this affects our waistlines. Why do you think in the United States, heart disease is the number one killer? Look at how after a certain age, all the, well, I don't want to just pick on guys, but usually all the men get that beer belly, right? This trend will continue to contribute to global warming, widespread pollution. Remember that a recent report came out on climate change. And this report was so bleak that many people were depressed about it, right? Okay, but your depression, if you are depressed but you're not doing anything about it, that's not going to change the world. The earth is going to get to a certain temperature where there will be no going back. We need to change now. And the report said that it's basically we have our opportunity for changes within the next 10 years. Otherwise, there's no going back. We are going to see famine. We're going to see uh, thirst. We're not going to have water. We're going, it's going to feel like Armageddon, right? So widespread pollution, deforestation, land degradation, water scarcity, and species extinction. More animals mean more crops are needed to feed them. And this planet cannot feed both increasing human and farmed animal populations, especially when there will be between two to four billion more human mouths to feed by 2050. Two to four billion more people on this planet. Our earth cannot sustain all these people. That is why a lot of these millionaires are looking, they know what's coming. So they're looking into genetically modified foods. But Yes, we are very smart and wise sometimes because the things we do sometimes baffle me. So sometimes we're very smart and wise, but we cannot play God. When we start playing with our food, when we start genetically modifying it, it, cre it is not how it was intended to be. And what we're seeing with genetically modified foods is that it's triggering more allergic reactions in people. Now think about it. If these foods are causing more allergic reactions in our bodies, allergies means inflammation. So what is that? contributing to more asthma, more autoimmune diseases because inflammation is autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases are through the roof. I know so many people now when I was growing up, but you know, when I was growing up, lupus wasn't as pre prevalent. Rheumatoid arthritis wasn't as prevalent. Autism wasn't as prevalent. Now it seems like every other kid has autism. Women have systemic lupus, even men, rheumatoid arthritis. You know, it's just something is going on something is occurring these pesticides that they're exposing us to are dangerous so many things so many issues my last reason for going vegan was animal cruelty and this is one i am very passionate about so animals yes even fish are complex creatures that are fully capable of experiencing pain and joy a lot of these animals live in cramped filthy living conditions. And I did not want to contribute to that. I did not want to be the reason why, because of my food choices, that this poor little animal for his entire life lived in a cramped space, tortured, never saw sunlight, just because I want to eat it, just for, to please my palate, just for a whim. Animal agriculture also kills wild animals. 
So each year in the U.S., more than 3 million animals, including endangered species such as golden and bald eagles, cats, dogs, are killed by wildlife services in order that they don't attack livestock. And these animals are often killed indiscriminately, often in painful and drawn-out ways. And the current trend of free-range farming will only mean more collateral damage to animals living freely in nearby areas. Eggs aren't harmless. A lot of people are like, well, I'll just go vegetarian, right? But hens and industrial farms are forced to lay up to 30 times more eggs than they would naturally. And again, they're in these little crates and they cut their beaks off so that they don't peck each other's eyes out. 95% of all egg-laying hens live out their lives in cramped battery cages where they're often cruelly de-beaked and frequently suffer from broken bones, hemorrhaging, and dehydration. So each year, this is saying 200 million male chicks are killed by the egg production industry, typically by suffocation or ground up alive in industrial macerators. So they take these little baby chicks um, that are male and they don't serve a purpose anymore and they will suffocate them or they will throw them in these grinders. Just They have an assembly line and these people are just picking them out, picking them out. Dairy is not harmless either, right? So most newborn calves are forcibly removed from their mothers within 12 hours so that milking can begin. And this separation is extremely distressing to both the mother and her calf. Imagine they're taking your baby away from you. How would you feel as a mother? They often call for each other for days. <sighs> then the calf will spend the first two to three months trapped alone in a small pen and fed a special milk replacer engineered to fatten them up for production as quickly as possible. If they're going to be made into veal, um, then they never leave that small crate because they don't want them moving around because the more tender the meat the better. Again, it's just so inhumane that I couldn't partake in this industry anymore. Once they're old enough to lactate, and keep in mind, I am trying to make this video because sometimes a lot of the PETA videos are so awful that people are like, I just can't, I just can't watch this. It's too much, right? So I'm trying to make this video not to shock you, not to scare you, more of a informational, educational, but this is the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more cruelty and inhumanity and effects to the environment that are going on that I am not going to even cover in this video. Again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So once they're old enough to lactate, they begin a, a, a cycle of forced impregnation that takes an increasingly heavy toll on their bodies. Imagine being impregnated for the rest of your life. When production declines around age four or five, less than a quarter of their natural lifespan, most dairy cows are unceremoniously slaughtered and sold for meat. And when they are slaughtered, they are not slaughtered in a humane way. A lot of these individuals that work at slaughterhouses, um, they get paid very little and they're frustrated and they're fed up with their jobs and they take it out on the animals. So they're beating them, they're bashing them over their head. It's, it's ridiculous. This is an account from a journalist of what goes on in slaughterhouses. And um, it was published in NPR. He said he's holding an object that looks like a power nailing gun or something. It's a pneumatic device called a stunner. This essentially injects a metal bolt. It's about the size and length of a thick pencil into its brain, right between the eyes, and that should render the animal brain dead. Key word here is should, right? What if they don't place it right? What if they miss slightly? And this poor animal is stunned, but not necessarily brain dead, right? At that point, chains will be attached to his rear legs. He will be lifted up by the chains. The chains are attached to an overhead trolley, and then he will be bled. And another person in another station will stick a long knife in and cut his aorta and bleed the animal. And then he will completely be dead. But there's time here, right? Between the time he's he's they cut his aorta and he's blood, he's suffering. And these individuals, these 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 animals, they know they're being led to the slaughterhouse. So cortisol, let me just let you in on a little tip. Cortisol wreaks havoc on the body. Anytime that these animals are scared or they're stressed, their levels of cortisol increase. And we are consuming all of these hormones that are raging through their body and then those are going into our bodies and from there he goes through a series of stations to clean him and to remove his hide one of the real problems is that animals have spent their lives lying in their manure 
are smeared and caked with the stuff and they're entering the food plant. And so many steps are taken to make sure that the manure doesn't infect the meat, which can happen very easily. And this is really just the source of food safety problems in the industry. Is microbes in the manure getting into the meat? So how do you stop that? Back to what I was telling you about the post-mortem post -mortem quality problems. Meat quality may be affected by both the pre-slaughter handling of the live animals and the post-slaughter handling of the carcasses. So again, this is true and found evidence. This isn't me just making up woo-woo facts, as I like to call them. Psychological or physical stress experienced by the animals produces biochemical changes in the muscles that may adversely affect the quality of the meat. In addition, postmortem muscles are susceptible to adverse biochemical reactions in response to certain external factors such as temperature. So once again, we are consuming all of these biochemical changes when they're experiencing this psychological or physical stress. We are what we eat, right? They pump these animals full of antibiotics. Antibiotic resistance is growing. I'm in school to be a nurse practitioner. They are telling us constantly, you have to be good stewards of antibiotics. Yes, that's important. But the number one reason why antibiotic resistance is occurring is actually due to overuse in animals, and that's not being addressed, right? Again, these animals are living in cramped, filthy conditions. It is a festering ground for superbugs to develop. So what do they do? They throw antibiotics at them, right? But what is happening? The bacteria is getting stronger. It's finding ways to become resistant to these antibiotics. Next, let's talk about growth hormones, right? People are so worried about soy and tofu and, oh, you shouldn't be eating soy and tofu. I do consume products such as Gardein, which are protein supplements, so I also get my protein from them. And they're like, oh, those aren't good. That's also highly processed. Okay, well, growth hormones are used to increase size in animals, and animals are injected with synthetic estrogen and testosterone, synthetic being the key word. Now, it is a known fact in the medical community that when women go through menopause and they are given synthetic estrogen, their risk of breast cancer increases. Again, we are not God. We try to get as close as possible to making these synthetic hormones mimic real estrogen or mimic real testosterone, but hormone replacement therapy does increase your risk of breast cancer. So when they're injecting these animals with estrogen, what do you, you know, that's going to increase your risk of getting breast cancer. Well, maybe I still get breast cancer. Maybe, you know, nothing is guaranteed in this world. This world is so polluted. Our soil is so polluted that even if we're buying organic and all that, we're still going to be exposed to pesticides. But I am doing my part for myself, for the environment, for the animals. I'm doing my best. And Gardein, the, it's non-GMO. It's not genetically modified. It has ingredients that you can read on the label. It does come in a package, so it is somewhat processed. But I'm picking the lesser of two evils, and it tastes delicious, right? So it's humane, tastes delicious, not genetically modified. It's much better. I will take that any day over meat. I will take that any day over the chicken that has been laying in filth and manure all day. The modern production of food incorporates a wide range of synthetic chemicals. Again, they're putting all these chemicals into the food. Do you not think it is, react it is affecting our system? The Food and Drug Administration will say, oh, well, it's below the level of toxicity. We're fine. Yes, this chemical is below the level of toxicity, but you're also exposing your body to nine other chemicals of toxicity. So when these 10 chemicals combine, how are these 10 chemicals reacting in our body, especially over a prolonged period of time? And if that weren't enough, non-organic meats may be radiated, so here's a dose of radiation for you. So once again, like I tell you, I will pick the lesser of two evils. I do choose to not eat canned foods. I don't eat canned foods um, because a lot of them are uh, radiated and against botulism. So whenever possible, I don't eat canned foods. Everything will be frozen, like I eat frozen vegetables, uh, the ones that come in the frozen vegetable bags, um, perhaps things in cartons, uh, but yeah. So at the end of the day, you decide, right? Fruits. You can eat fruits of all colors and types. I know keto is through the roof in popularity right now. 
unless you have a severe seizure disorder in which there have been studies that show that a keto diet helps reduce seizures, keto diet, not good, not healthy for you. Why? Because it's clogging your arteries and you're going to have a heart attack when you're 50 or 40. That's what you're doing to your body. There's no way that you can tell me that a diet where you can eat bacon and high fat foods is healthy for your heart. Again, you're contributing to being a statistic of in the United States. Our, what is our, our um, stereotype? We're fat, we're overweight, and we're lazy. That's our stereotype. Again, stereotype. Are we all that way? No. There's been a big push. A lot of people now are being vegan. It's gaining momentum. But if we want to beat what has been going on in our history, right? So much cancer is about to surpass the number one killer in the United States, heart disease. Number two, cancer. And cancer is about to surpass heart disease. So a lot of these things, and again, another study came out recently that our diet is such a huge contributor to cancer. Now, some people get cancer and it's not their fault. There's nothing that they could have done to prevent it. It's just bad luck, right? But there are some cancers that if you eat McDonald's every single day and you're eating that pesticide that they put in their french fries because they don't want it to have any brown spots in it, you're exposing your body to pesticide every day, day in and day out. You don't think that genetic mutations are going on in your body that's going to make you get cancer? Think about it. So fruits. You can eat fruits of all types. That's what I love about my vegan diet. I can eat fruits. I eat, I eat so much as a vegan and my weight stays in check. Remember how I told you I struggled with weight? Well, once I became vegan, my weight issues really stopped. I eat a lot and I don't worry about gaining weight. I don't worry about calories. I don't look at uh, nuts and legumes or uh, seeds and I'm like, wow, this has, or avocado, and I'm like, wow, this has this many grams of fat. No, if I want an avocado, I don't care about its fat content. What I read are labels. What I read are for chemicals. So I avoid chemicals at all costs. I don't drink soda. I don't drink diet soda. That's even worse. Um, again, I try to avoid things uh, in a can. So there you have it. There you have my reasons for being a vegan. I hope you learned something today, and I hope you understand a little bit more about veganism and, and how it really does help the environment. People like to make fun of things that they don't understand. And so being a vegan for so long, when I first became a vegan, I was telling everybody about it. But now that I've been a vegan for so long, it's kind of like, I'll equate it with someone that just came out of the closet, right? When someone just comes out of the closet, they're like, I'm gay, I'm gay and loud and proud, right? But after someone's been gay for a while, they're just like, yeah, I'm gay. It's just like, they, it's just a part of who I am. It's not who I am, right? So I do not go around shouting veganism from the rooftops or just constantly talking about it. but. I truly still do believe in the benefits of it, and I truly still do believe that it can um, help people live such a better, healthier, happier lifestyle. It can help prevent depression. It can help prevent anxiety. All these processed foods can contribute to depression and anxiety because you're not getting the nutrients that your brain needs to function appropriately. So am I passionate about it? Yes. Do I talk about it as much as I used to? No. And perhaps maybe I should. But I feel like now that veganism is so popular, a lot of other people are picking up that torch and they are talking about veganism. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you've learned something new or at least you understand why vegans go vegan and that we're not all some crazy radicals. We're doing it for a good reason. And make sure you uh, tune in. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe button.